I'm Nathan Rutherford, and welcome to Myth Madness. Perseus was one of the most celebrated heroes of Greek mythology, and is the focus of this episode. His name means destroyer, and the hero is easy to find in examples of classical art. He is usually shown as a youth with winged boots and a cap, and armed with a special sword called a harpy. Perseus was most famous for his slaying of the Gorgon Medusa, and a handful of other adventures along the way. But he was also a very important founder figure, and was the legendary ancestor of the royal houses of Mycenae, Elis, Sparta, Messenia, and even faraway Persia. His most famous descendant was the hero Heracles. This episode will cover Perseus's youth and how he came to have his showdown with Medusa. Perseus was the son of Zeus and a woman named Danae. The Greeks were pretty consistent with the parents and birth story of Perseus. Homer, Pindar, Apollodorus, Diodorus, and even Nonus and Ovid all say the same thing, or at least refer to the same plot points. Apollodorus gives a particularly detailed and yet straightforward account of Perseus' life, starting with the circumstances of his birth and on through various quests. I'm going to mostly follow along with Apollodorus' version here, and bring in others as we go. The story begins with Perseus's grandfather, Acrisios, and his brother, Proitos. They were twins, and they did not like each other. They were said to have fought each other in the womb, and eventually battled when they were adults. Hey, not every sibling gets along. But the problem was, these two were princes. Their father was the king of Argos, a powerful kingdom in southern Greece. When their father died, the brothers fought a civil war. Acrisius was victorious and exiled his brother, but Proidos went to another city, married the daughter of its king, gathered an army, and then used it to take over a city near Argos called Tyrants. The war was over, but now we have the two brothers ruling as the kings of two different neighboring cities. You can imagine that Acrisios got fairly paranoid from the war with his brother, but he did have a justified reason. Acrisios did not have any sons, only a daughter named Danae. He worried that without any sons, when he was old and weak, his brother would just swoop in with an army and take over Argos. So Acrisios went to an oracle, to learn what he could do about his no-son problem. And as oracles tend to do, Acrisios was given a whole other problem to worry about. The oracle told him that any son born to his daughter Danae would kill him. Acrisius feared for his life and set out to prevent the prophecy from ever being fulfilled. He constructed a bronze room sunk in the earth, basically a jail cell in a dungeon, and he kept his daughter imprisoned inside of it. The room was kept under guard, so no one could approach it. No one mortal, that is. Bronze walls and guards aren't going to stop any motivated Olympians wandering by. And sure enough, Zeus, the king of the universe, spied Danae and and became attracted to the beautiful princess. With other women, Zeus often turns himself into different animals to get close to those he was interested in. Eagles, bulls, cuckoo birds. But even a small animal wasn't going to get through the bars separating Danae's prison chamber from the outside world above. So instead, Zeus took on a very strange shape. He turned himself into a stream of liquid gold and this stream passed through the opening in the ceiling of Danae's prison and showered down on top of her. This bizarre scene was very popular in Greek art. Some Greek vases even show Danae lifting up her dress to catch the golden rain in her lap. As it happens, contact with the gold rain caused Danae to become pregnant. In time, she gave birth to a son named Perseus. One Hellenistic source... Apollonius of Rhodes says Perseus was not his original name, and that his mother called the boy Eurymedon. Since Perseus means destroyer, maybe he gained that name after killing the Gorgon. But there's no way to tell for sure. Other than that one example, he's always called Perseus. Shortly after the birth, Acrisius found out his attempt at avoiding the prophecy was defeated. He was furious and frightened and he decided to get rid of his daughter and baby grandson. He sealed them up in a chest, and cast the chest into the sea. I'm sure you're wondering, why didn't Acrisio simply have his daughter and grandson killed? Would have been fairly straightforward, 
and with their corpses as proof, he would have been assured of his safety. But Acrisius couldn't do that. Having them killed would have meant that he had murdered blood relatives, and this was something in ancient Greece that was considered a very bad sin. The gods took displeasure in things like this, and their wrath was brutal. Sealing Danae and Perseus up in a box and hoping they died at sea was an attempt by Acrisius to get them killed without being guilty of murder on the technicality that he didn't physically do it himself. But the chest was not destroyed, and Danae and Perseus did not drown or suffocate. The chest itself drifted in the ocean currents and finally came ashore at the island of Seraphos. It was found by a man named Dictes. The Greek playwright Aeschylus wrote a play focusing on this part of the story in the 5th century BC. In his play, Dictes has satyrs, half-goat, half-man hybrids, pull in the chest with fishing nets. The whole play was actually lost, as were Aeschylus' sequels telling the rest of the Perseus story. All the other versions say it was Dictes that found the chest, broke it open, and then took Danae and Perseus home with him. The ruler of the island of Seraphos was a man named Polydictes. He was Dictes' brother. He noticed the young woman Danae now living with Dictes, and he desired her for himself. But time and time again, she rejected his advances. Years went by, and Perseus grew up. Polydictes saw Perseus, a strong and protective young man, as an obstacle to getting Danae, and he planned to get rid of him. Polydictes gathered Perseus and a number of young men together. He told them he was going to try and marry another young woman named Hippodamia. This is the same Hippodamia who eventually married the hero Pelops. As their leader, Polydictes collected horses and other valuables from the young men, saying that they would help him in his attempt to woo Hippodamia. But when he got to Perseus, the young man, who was poor, didn't have anything to give him, so Polydictes tricked him into promising something else, to go and find a monster, the Gorgon Medusa and bring Polydictes back her severed head. There's no word on how this was supposed to help Polydictes, or where this monster was even supposed to be. The whole thing was really an excuse to send Perseus away, and leave Polydictes free to get Danae. Perseus, a young man from a poor family, straw between his teeth, was still ready and willing to set out on the impossible task. But he needs a little help to get started. Fortunately, he gets some help, from the gods themselves. Hermes and Athena took a special interest in Perseus. Today, it's commonly believed that they provided Perseus with several special items that would help him in his quest. However, in Apollodorus' version of the Perseus myth, the two gods did not do this. Instead, they help him find other people that will provide him with what he needs. Hermes and Athena guided Perseus to the cave of the Phercydes, these are the daughters of an immortal sea god named Forkies. These daughters are also more commonly known as the Grey Eye. Apollodorus gives their names as Enyo, Pareto, and Dano, and they are described as old women, with only one eye and one tooth. They take turns passing the eye and tooth around, so each has a chance to see and eat. There are a couple different traditions of them, though. For instance, the Roman poet Ovid says that there were only two sisters, and not three. But, as Apollodorus says, the women passed the eye and tooth to each other, and Perseus, when he arrived, snuck in the middle and grabbed both out of their hands. He forced the sisters to tell him where he could find a group of nymphs, saying he wouldn't return the eye and tooth until they had done so. Now, there are tons of different nymphs in Greek mythology, and it's not clear from Apollodorus' version who exactly these specific nymphs were, or where they lived. It's possible they were supposed to have lived in the far north, but Apollodorus doesn't say. In an earlier account, the 5th century BC poet Pindar says Perseus traveled to the land of the Hyperboreans, a mythical land that was located somewhere in northern Europe, and that Perseus feasted with their ruler. Maybe Apollodorus' nymphs were Pindar's Hyperboreans, or maybe this is a completely different adventure that we just don't know the details of. According to Apollodorus, when the Grey Eye told Perseus where to find the nymphs, he honorably returned them their tooth and eye. But in one late period version, after he is done with the Grey Eye, Perseus threw their eye and tooth into a lake, and the Grey Eye howled to each other as they struggled in vain to find them again. Not a very heroic move on the part of Perseus. 
but with his newfound knowledge, Perseus was able to approach the nymphs and receive what he had come for. They provided him with a bag, winged sandals that allowed him to fly, and a cap, which turned him invisible. Perseus also got some other gifts, too. Hermes provided him with an adamant sword. It seems like a lot of magic items for just one hero, and in fact this gives us an opportunity to look at how these items fit into the different myth traditions over time. So let me make a diversion to do just that. The earliest written reference to the Perseus myth is the Shield of Heracles poem, attributed to Hesiod. In this poem, Heracles' shield is a highly decorated treasure showing scenes from Greek myth. The poem describes these scenes, and so gives us a description of Perseus slaying the Gorgon. It's kind of cool, really. Here we have a poem describing a fictional artwork that in turn refers to a mythic event. On the Shield of Heracles, Perseus is described as wearing winged sandals able to move swift as thought, and shown with his feet not touching the ground. In addition to the winged sandals, Hesiod says this Perseus holds a black-sheathed sword, a tasseled bag called a cabices, and the cap of Hades. So, even in the earliest reference to Perseus, we still have our bag, cap, and winged sandals. So let's talk a little bit about them. First, the bag, or as it's called in Greek, the cabices. It's a pouch or sack that is going to allow Perseus to safely store the Gorgon's head he was sent to fetch. It doesn't do anything else. It's basically a grocery bag. The cap is often commonly known today as the Helmet of Hades, which is actually a misconception. Back in the Hades episode, I pointed out that it's not actually a helmet. The Greek word used to describe this item means a cap made from dog skin. Calling the cap a helmet seems to stem from translations of Greek myths written during the European Renaissance, centuries after ancient Greece was over. In the Hades episode, I also suggested that this dogskin cap of Hades may not actually even belong to the god Hades, and that this may just be another misconception, based on how people translate and use Hades' name. His name is actually a title, meaning something along the lines of the Unseen One, or the Invisible One. Funny enough, this may have been an open debate even during ancient times. The Roman writer Hagenus openly disputes the whole belonging to Hades the god thing. In his work The Astronomica, he says Perseus received the cap of the unseen. He did not wear the cap of the god Orcus, which is another name for the god Hades. Hagenus even mocks people who believe that, calling them ignorant. Hagenus is distinguishing a difference between a cap of being unseen and a cap belonging to the Invisible One. With the bag and cap, Perseus also received winged sandals. Hesiod, in the Archaic period, is the first poet to describe the sandals as having wings. Outside of the Perseus myth, other Archaic period sources link this wonderful item of footwear to the god Hermes. Homer, in the Odyssey, uses the word chrysia, meaning divine and made of gold, to describe them. The sandals are said to bear Hermes over the waters of the sea and over the boundless land swift as the blasts of the wind. This statement doesn't specifically mention the sandals as having wings, but it indicates flight, which is what the sandals are supposed to provide anyway. The same thing happens in the Homeric hymn to Hermes. There's no reference to winged, but it does say that they allow Hermes to move around without leaving footprints, which would suggest his feet don't touch the ground, and they allow him to fly. Later, artwork from the classical period shows the sandals as winged, and by the 3rd century BC, we have a clear written description of Hermes wearing winged sandals in an Orphic hymn. What we have here are not different versions for the sandals, but instead a stylistic change in how the special sandals are indicated, to listeners and viewers. Due to the strong connections to Hermes, it would make sense for the god to be the one who gives these winged sandals to Perseus. After all, he can just pull them off his own feet and hand them over to the hero to borrow. So why then in the Apollodorus version do we have this random group of nymphs that give them to Perseus? I find this detail really bizarre, but sure enough it seems to be only something Apollodorus and another Greek, Pausanias, record. In other versions, Perseus does get the winged sandals directly from Hermes. 
Hagenus's Astronomica is one such example. He even implies that they were a gift because Hermes loved the hero, which in itself is another pretty interesting take, and it reminds me of the myths of Pelops, where Poseidon provides winged horses. All of this makes me guess that perhaps there was a now lost version floating around somewhere in the archaic or classical period that had Hermes provide Perseus with all the gifts, winged sandals, and cap of invisibility. Finally, that brings us to Perseus's weapon of choice, which is probably the item that undergoes the most dramatic changes across Greek history. Hesiod says that Perseus holds a black sheathed sword. That's all he says. There's no other description of the sword. We don't know where it came from, and there's certainly no indication he got it from a god or goddess. It could just be a typical sword. Greek vase art from archaic and classical Greece usually shows Perseus wielding a special type of sword called a harpy, which is sometimes translated in literature as sickle. This kind of sword has a curved blade, although there are inconsistent variations. In the oldest artwork, the blade starts straight and then curves outwards, but other examples have the blade get broader as you move away from the hilt. Some other examples don't have Perseus with a sword at all. In these, he wields a pair of hunting spears. In literature, at least, the hunting spears do not appear. Instead, we get different swords. As I already mentioned, Hesiod only mentions a sword, which could have been provided by a god, or it could also just be the sword he took when he set out from home. After all, we can guess he would have grabbed one when he packed up. But then, several centuries later, we have Apollodorus say Hermes gave him an adamant sword. That adamant detail presents an interesting possibility. In Greek myth, adamant is a magic metal. It's supposed to be very strong. The word actually means unconquerable or untamable. Intriguingly, though, Apollodorus describes another adamant sword or sickle. This is the one used by the titan Kronos to castrate his father Aranos. Some people look at this and interpret, perhaps it's a reach, perhaps not, that the Kronos blade and the Perseus blade are the same. But in the Archaic period, or at least in Hesiod's Theogony, the Kronos one isn't even made of adamant. It is instead made of flint. Maybe in the later periods, the tradition of the sword shifted slightly, and the two blades were thought of as being the same. But Apollodorus never actually comes out and says it. Even if they are both made out of adamant, they could be two different swords. Sure enough, another late source, Hagenus, also mentions an adamant blade but he says it was given to Perseus by the god Hephaestus. This goes directly against the idea that this was the same adamant blade as the one used by Kronos. Nowhere else in the Perseus myths is Hephaestus mentioned as a provider of the sword, but Hephaestus does make and provide weapons and armor to other heroes in other myths. But there's also another version too, Nonus, writing one of the latest sources of Greek myths in the 4th century AD, also mentions Perseus's sickle sword, but he says it was provided to Perseus by the goddess Athena. It could be that these traditions were different attempts to explain where the sword came from. In the early years, there's no indication the sword was anything special. Much later, we get the descriptions of it being a new sword provided by Hephaestus or Athena, and possibly being the same weapon used by Kronos. Where this shift occurred is anyone's guess. We know that there were several Athenian plays telling the Perseus story written in the classical period. Unfortunately, the full plays are lost to history, but what version they may have held about where Perseus got his magic items would be very good to know. With all the items, and whoever gave them to him, Perseus now had what he needed, and was now ready to face the Gorgons. He flung on the Cabaeses bag, tied the sandals on his ankles, and placed the cap on his head. With the cap on, he could see whomever he cared to look at, but was invisible to others. Perseus learned the location of the Gorgons, likely from their grey eye sisters. The Gorgons lived at a remote, rocky place far away, and he flew over hills and forests to get there. The actual location varies in the different traditions. Hesiod's Theogony has a supernatural take, saying that their home was on the far side of a great big ocean river that encircles the earth. 
In the later versions, their home is placed somewhere in Libya, the name the Greeks had for northern Africa. Either way, both versions are really telling the same thing, the Gorgons lived far away in a distant, unexplored land that was definitely not Greece. In early periods, this was a vague somewhere near the edge of the world. In later periods, we have more specificity, but still a place most ancient Greeks would know as a distant, exotic location. Using the winged sandals, Perseus was able to fly to this unknown land. Along the way, in fields he passed, he saw people and animals all standing still like statues, turned into stone when the Gorgons had passed by. Eventually, he arrived at their home. It took him a while to get there, even with the winged sandals, and it was nighttime. According to a small fragment from Aeschylus's lost play, he rushed into the Gorgon's cave like a wild boar. Within, the three Gorgons were fast asleep. Their names were Steno, Uriali, and the third was Medusa. The Gorgons' heads were entwined with the horny scales of serpents, and they had big tusks, bronze hands, and wings of gold that allowed them to fly. Two of the monsters were immortal, but the third, Medusa, for whatever reason, was not. Because she was mortal, she was the one whose head Perseus was sent to get. In addition to the snake-covered heads, tusks, claws, and wings, anybody who looked at the Gorgons was turned to stone. For that reason, Perseus had to keep his head turned away as he approached the sleeping monsters. In fact, this almost always appears in Greek artwork depicting the scene. Perseus is shown with his head turned and his face looking the other way. But he wasn't completely blind. Fortunately, Perseus's bronze shield was well polished, and according to Apollodorus, he was able to observe the sleeping gorgons reflected in it. People assumed the shield was given to Perseus by Athena some kind of magic mirror shield, like the other objects he gained earlier. But there's no clear ancient Greek source that states this. It's really just a well-polished bronze shield, and probably just one that he brought from home. At the same time, while looking the other way, his hand was guided by Athena, and he was gradually brought to stand over the sleeping gorgons. When his sword was properly positioned, he lifted the blade high and cut off the gorgon's head with one sharp swipe to her neck. He beheaded her, and at that exact same moment, out from the stump of her severed neck, a winged horse named Pegasus and a man named Creseor were born. Perseus quickly placed the head of Medusa within his bag for safekeeping. But in all the commotion, whether it be the sound of Medusa getting killed, the cries from the newly born Pegasus and Creseor, or, as the poet Pindar says, because Perseus let out a loud cry of triumph, the other Gorgon sisters woke up. Both Hesiod at one end of Greek history and Nonus at the other described that Perseus fled away while the remaining two Gorgons hissed and bellowed after him. Fortunately for him, he was still wearing the cap of invisibility. Remaining hidden, the Gorgons could not identify the slayer of their sister, and Perseus safely escaped. In this way, the true function of each of Perseus's gifts was realized. The winged sandals got him to where he needed to go. The sword allowed him to actually do the deed, and the cap allowed him to get back safe and sound. And that's all for today, but it isn't the end of the road for Perseus. This episode was only part one of the Perseus myths. In it, I discussed the feud between Perseus's grandfather Acrisios and his twin brother Proitos and how Acrisios, after approaching an oracle, feared he would be killed by any grandson his daughter Danae gave birth to. So, trying to circumvent the prophecy, he imprisoned Danae, but didn't account for the god Zeus getting her pregnant anyway. He tried to drown his daughter and her newborn baby in the ocean, but they ended up on the island of Seraphos. Several years later, Perseus was grown up, and the cruel king of Seraphos, Polydictes, tried to get rid of Perseus so he could have Danae all to himself. That was the trigger for Perseus's quest to bring back the Gorgon Medusa's head. With a little help from the gods Hermes and Athena, and some divine treasures, Perseus was able to find Medusa and kill her. Next episode, we'll pick up from this point and cover Perseus's adventures on his way home and what he did once returning to Greece. So stay tuned, and thank you for listening. 
If you're enjoying this podcast, please spread the word by sharing it with a friend.